Hello and welcome to the HistoryNetwork.org podcast. If you would like to become a patron of the podcast, just go along to Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com forward slash The History Network. The History Network.org podcast, season 29, episode 2, the two and a half thousandth anniversary of the battles of Thermopylae, Artemisium, and Salamis 480 BC, part 1. This episode was written by Murray Darm. Murray Darm is an ancient and medieval military historian from New Zealand living in Australia. He has written more than 100 articles on various aspects of ancient and medieval military history, as well as other historical topics from all periods, ranging from the history of opera to the runic alphabet and the recipients of the Victoria Cross. He is the author of Combat 40, Macedonian Phalangite vs. Persian Warrior, Alexander Confronts the Achaemenids, 334-331 BC, from Osprey Publishing. He is a regular on the Ancient Warfare podcast. The year 2020 represents the two and a half thousandth anniversary of three battles which played a major part in shaping the future of the Western Mediterranean world, the battles of Thermopylae, Artemisium and Salamis. In the summer of 480 BC, the Persian king Xerxes I invaded mainland Greece with a massive army rumoured to number five million men and with 1,200 warships drawn from 47 nations already subject to Persia. The army had been gathered in 481, and three years' supplies had been gathered for it, and must have been an undertaking unlike any other. No one today believes the Greek historian Herodotus's numbers. They are usually reduced to half a million men, or as few as 200,000, but the invasion was still the largest the world had ever seen. Ostensibly, the invasion was to punish the Greek city of Athens for its part in a revolt of Persian vassal states in Ionia almost 20 years earlier. Eritrea, the other Greek state which had participated, had already been punished before the Battle of Marathon in 490 BC, a battle Athens then unexpectedly won. No one then or now believed that punishing Athens was the true purpose of the expedition, however. With such resources brought to bear, Xerxes's true purpose was nothing less than the conquest of Greece, to add it as the westernmost province of the vast Persian Empire, which stretched from India to Turkey and from Kazakhstan to Egypt. The Persians advanced, crossing the Hellespont on a bridge of pontoons in April, and then marching along the coast towards mainland Greece. The landward march was shadowed by the fleet. As they progressed, the Persians demanded earth and water, the traditional symbols of submission from every community not already subjected to her. Most Greek cities submitted to the Persian envoys, as few as 10% chose to resist, something most cities who had submitted subsequently sought to forget. Only Athens and Sparta were ignored in these demands, Athens because she was the focus of the expedition and had put previous envoys on trial, and Sparta because her council had thrown the Persian envoys demanding earth and water into a well in 491 BC. Greece at this time was a very loose collection of city-states, governed in different ways and with different languages and interests. Even though we talk of Greece, it is wrong to think of it as anything like the modern country. The Greek cities spent most of their time warring with each other over land and religious disputes. The two largest city-states, Athens and Sparta, were atypical of the majority of other cities. 
Most were smaller and looked to Sparta and Athens, in that order, for leadership. Sparta, centred in the Peloponnese, had a unique dual monarchy system of government and was primarily concerned with maintaining a military system to control its lands. These were run via a system of state slavery, helotry, which allowed the Spartan citizens, Spartiates, to concentrate on military training. Sparta was therefore the natural military leader of Greece, especially on land. Unfortunately, Sparta's concerns were mostly localised, helots outnumbering Spartans by up to twenty to one, and it took a great deal of persuasion to get the Spartans to venture out of the Peloponnese. Athens, by contrast, controlled a large land base in Attica and had a fledgling political system, democracy, which in 480 was barely 30 years old. Athens was a hotbed of capitalism and new ideas in drama, philosophy and many other subjects. She was a self-confident city and put herself forward as Sparta's equal. Athens had defeated the first attempt to punish its involvement in the Ionian Revolt ten years earlier at the Battle of Marathon, where she almost single-handedly defeated a much smaller Persian army. By this victory, Athens' self-confidence had exploded. The Greeks, especially the Athenians, knew that the Persians would return to punish them after their defeat at Marathon. In 482, Athens had built a huge fleet of 200 triremes using the wealth of the recently exploited silver mines at Laurion. This policy was the brainchild of Thermistocles, Athens's leading statesman, who would play a leading role in the naval battles of Artemisium and Salamis. The Persians moved through Thrace and into Macedonian territory, reaching Therm, modern Thessaloniki, in three months, a distance of 600 kilometres. Delegates from the Greek cities had already met, and it was decided that troops should meet and resist the Persian advance at Tempe, on the border of Thessaly and Macedonia. 10,000 hoplites were dispatched, but when informed by Alexander I of Macedon that their position could easily be avoided, they abandoned it. Alexander thereafter gained a reputation as a Philhellene, a lover of the Greeks, even though his advice meant that the Persian army would not be camping and fighting in his territory. The next defensible pass was at Thermopylae far to the south and which meant many Greek cities would have little choice but to submit to Persia. The states that joined with Persia were known as Medizes, the Medes being synonymous with the Persians since both came from the same homeland territory. Thermopylae guarded the entrance to Boeotia, Attica and the Peloponnese. The pass at Thermopylae was only a single wagon wide at some points, impassable cliffs rising on the west side and with the sea and marshland on the other. The position was chosen since the enemy numbers and cavalry would be unable to operate effectively. At the same time as defending the land pass at Thermopylae, the decision was taken to dispatch the combined Greek fleet to Artemisium between the island of Skiathos and Magnesia on the mainland and Artemisium on the northern coast of Euboea, the site of a shrine to Artemis, and prevent the Persians from passing further south by sea there. It is unclear if these were intended as final stands. Given the small numbers of troops and the tactics of the fleet, this seemed unlikely, and a delaying action seems a much more plausible purpose of these positions. At Artemisium, Herodotus tells us of the 1207 triremes of the Persian fleet, each had 200 rowers and an additional 30 men on each ship to act as marines, giving the vast total of 276,610 men. In addition, he tells us that there were 3,000 smaller craft Pentaconters, each with a crew of 80, another 240,000 men. 
Arriving at Magnesia, no beach was long enough, and the Persian ships needed to moor out to sea eight deep. This was fine as long as the weather remained calm, but with the storms typical of the area and time of year, the first but not the last examples of the Persians not understanding local conditions, just such a storm arose, and at least 400 ships were destroyed. The Persian land army continued its inexorable advance, drinking local rivers dry, and they reached Malice and Trachis just above Thermopylae. The Greeks gathered their own land forces there to face the Persian horde. Herodotus gives us intricate detail of the numbers, so many more than the 300 Spartans of popular legend. He tells us that there were also a thousand men from Tegea and Mantinea, 400 from Corinth, 1100 from Arcadia, 1000 Phocians, 700 Thespians and 400 Thebans. All told, more than four and a half thousand hoplites. The Spartan king, Leonidas, was acknowledged as the leader of the whole force. The remaining Spartan forces were delayed from marching out by the religious festival of the Carnea. The Olympian festival was also being held, and may have delayed other cities from sending out more of their troops as well. Informed of the small numbers opposing him, Xerxes was incredulous and waited for four days expecting the Greeks to melt away in fear. When this did not occur, on the fifth day he sent troops against them, expecting a quick and easy victory. Instead, the Greeks resisted and fought all day. This disabused Xerxes of his belief. The Greeks would withdraw, and he sent his ten thousand immortals against the Greeks. These were his elite troops, selected from the bravest and the best fighters of Persia and Media, called immortal because any casualties were immediately replaced from the remaining Persian and Median ranks. Hence, there were always ten thousand of them. The immortals were also driven back by the Greeks, however, and any tactic attempted by the Persians was met with the same result, defeat. The following day, Persian attacks continued, but were met with the same humiliation. There was a mountain pass used by goat herders around the pass at Thermopylae, known as the Anapaea Pass, of which the Greek commanders were ignorant when they chose the position. Informed of this weakness, Leonidas dispatched the thousand Phaeacians to guard the pass. After two days of defeat, a man named Ephialtes from Malice came forward to Xerxes and told him of the mountain pass. He agreed to lead a force of Persians around, behind the Greek position at Thermopylae. The ten thousand immortals were sent with Ephialtes, and their march took the entire night, reaching the highest point at dawn. Due to the trees, the Phaeacians did not notice the Persians' ascent, and now, seeing the overwhelming numbers and being peppered with arrows, they withdrew to the highest point on the ridge, where they were stationed, and prepared to defend themselves. The Persians, however, then continued on their way along the pass. In the darkness, various deserters from the Persian side informed Leonidas of the night march around behind his position. Leonidas gathered all the Greeks and sent them all away except for the Thespians and Thebans. There were, therefore, roughly 1,400 hoplites left to defend Thermopylae when the final Persian assault came. Xerxes moved to attack in the morning, and the remaining Greeks, knowing that more Persians were coming from behind them, also moved to meet the attack. Driven by grim determination, they sold their lives dearly on the Persians, inflicting massive casualties. Leonidas fell, and the battle raged over his corpse. When immortals arrived in the rear of the Thermopylae position, the Greeks withdrew to a small hill, and there they were cut down, buried beneath a cascade of Persian arrows. One of the Spartans, Dionysus, was credited with a pithy quip when informed of the number of Persian arrows which blotted the sun. Then we shall fight them in the shade. Once the body of Leonidas was identified, Xerxes had his head cut off and put on a spike, a sacrilegious act, showing how angry the Persian was at being opposed. 
On the same day as the men at Thermopylae opposed the Persians, the combined Greek fleet faced the might of the Persian navy at Artemisium. We are told that Athens provided the most ships by some margin, 127 triremes. Next came Corinth with 40 and Megara with 20. The total number of Greek ships was 271 triremes, and these faced, even with losses, some 800 Persian ships. The command, as at Thermopylae, was ceded to a Spartan they being recognised as the natural leaders of Greece. Eurybiades therefore commanded, although most consider that Themistocles was the real power, which considered Athens contributed almost half the total number of Greek ships, is not unlikely. Just as at Thermopylae the Persians expected the Greeks to run away, in order to trap and destroy them, however, they dispatched 200 ships around Skiathos and Euboea, to block the Greek fleet's retreat. This was another Persian move which failed to understand the waters and the local weather conditions, and this contingent was also destroyed and lost in a storm. The Greek fleet therefore put out against the remaining Persian ships to test their skill in local waters. The Persian commanders welcomed the battle, fully expecting that they could capture the Greek fleet, given they outnumbered it by two to one. The Persian fleet therefore encircled the Greek fleet, but the Greeks formed defensive circles of their own, with prows facing out and sterns more tightly packed. When the Persian ships attempted to capture the Greeks, they met stern defence, and thirty Persian ships were themselves captured. Night brought an end to the day's battle, and both sides broke off. A storm in the night terrified the Persian crews and wrecked the fleet trying to round Euboea. Another 53 Athenian ships arrived in the morning and the Greeks attacked a contingent of the Persian fleet. The fleet as a whole was reluctant to offer battle again. The following day, when the men at Thermopylae were overcome, the Persian commanders put out to sea to engage once more, taking up a crescent formation. When the Greeks came out and faced the enemy, the Persian numbers actually worked against them, fouling one another's oars in their attempts to capture Greek ships, and thus earn rewards from their king when he heard of their daring. Five Greek ships were captured, however, and more than half damaged. Themistocles designed a ruse to escape in the night and to keep the majority of the Greek fleet intact. At this moment a pre-arranged messenger arrived by ship from Thermopylae, with news of the eventual defeat there. The decision to withdraw was made. The road was open by both land and sea for Persia to advance south. Thanks for the great script, Murray. We will continue with this two-parter with the Battle of Salamis, September 480 BC, in the next episode in a couple of weeks time remember you can get the podcast slightly early and receive other benefits by becoming a patron of the podcast and you can do that by going to patreon.com forward slash the history network thanks again for listening you've been listening to the history network dot org podcast written by murray darm read by nick barker <laughs>